How's it going, everybody? Brian Elverson, Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio. It is February 19, 2024. Figure 4 online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. It is Monday night here on the show. Still Monday night here. It's much later where uh, the rest of you are, but we got you're, a raw show to you're, talk you're, about. You're only, it's only like 9.45 there, right? It's 9.45. Which yeah. is another reason I should just live here because maybe I should maybe I should too. Well, no, then then uh, we'd still be going late. I like no. when you're going late, but I'm actually going early. No, that would be I, I, we'd be, we'd be done. We wouldn't have to go late if we were here. Uh, maybe, maybe I don't. We I figure if shows- you if you moved here, it would still be at one a.m. Hawaii time. Why? I don't know. It just feels like it'd be like that. <laughs> the reason it wouldn't be is because well, the reason the reason I want to go late. Well, usually it's just a question of watching all those shows. I would, you know, the shows the the shows would be on at the same time, except it's two hours earlier. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to this coming Wednesday, but uh, we're going to do the best we can. Hey, at this least thing. I can watch the show earlier here. I watched it at uh, six o'clock Hawaii time, which was much yeah. much earlier than usual. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, Saturday's incredible, though. Are you only home by Saturday? Nope, going to do it from here. Saturday's like, it's just, I don't even know what to do. I think I'm just going to, like, toss a coin on which shows I'm going to watch. We've got uh, WWE, which I will watch, of course. And then there's um, two Japan shows, because there's going to be the one on Friday night, and then the one the one on Saturday night is actually, like, at 9 o'clock, I believe, our time. So it's actually like Saturday night at a decent hour, and then there's collision, and there's um, UFC's got a show um, from Mexico City. It's at, and with two good, with two good main events, and PFL's got their uh, biggest pay per view in their history from Saudi Arabia, which I doubt I doubt I'll have time to watch, and um, there's probably other shows that I'm not even thinking of. No, maybe that's it. Maybe it's only five shows. That's probably about it. Well, I'll be watching the uh, the WWE show. So if you end up wanting to uh, watch something else, I can I can fully. Well, I have to watch one, the but... I have to watch WWE, but uh, the uh, both New Japan shows are, are are real big shows. So um, I don't you know, especially with um, um, you know Matt Riddle and uh, Nick Nemeth debuting in in pretty high profile matches, and uh, Okada's last match and Tamatonga's last match ever ever in New Japan. So they're uh, they're pretty big shows, yeah. Well, we can start off today uh, a, a rare day that we can talk about some good news, and that is that Steve McMichael appears to be doing better. He was battling MRSA, and it was not looking and, good. And, and pneumonia. And pneumonia. And yeah. they're thinking that he may be going home early, and uh, maybe not early. We'll see about I mean, the Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah, I think that they're hoping... Uh, this afternoon, I was told um, they're hoping for maybe uh, two or three days that he could get out of the hospital. But yeah, it was a bleak weekend. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I, did you ever see the ESPN video of him? The ESPN I package? did. It's, it was yeah. tremendous. And uh, it was, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you can just see the whole thing. And the smile on his face when they uh, when he found out he was in the Hall of Fame was, you know, for a guy who can like literally barely move, but he was able to smile. Um, cause I mean, pretty much all he can do is move his mouth and his, and his eyes, right? Pretty much. Yeah. It's, it's, it's horrible. And it's, I mean, you should actually, it's, it's, it's an ESPN video that it's, that's up there, but he can, he has got a way of moving his eyes where it goes to like a voice machine and there's like, you know, 10 or 15 things that he can say, like, I want ice cream or, you know, I need, I'm in pain or whatever, you know, so he, he actually can communicate. And from all accounts, his brain is 100%, which in some ways makes this even more brutal because you got this guy who, um, you know, was, I mean, any guy, now it just, yeah, he was a great athlete and everything when he was younger, but, but this guy who, um, you know, his brain is fully functioning and he just has to lie there. He can't move his arms. He can't, it gets, and it gets worse and worse. You know what I mean? He's, He's in the a very rough period, and I mean, obviously, the goal is for him to uh, the the Hall of Fame induction ceremony is August third, and I think that's what he's living for. I don't know. I mean, hopefully, he can make it. He wants to go to Canton. I don't know if that's going to be possible, but it would be it would be amazing if he could go. But uh, you know, they're you know he he wants to go. I mean, that's the one the the key thing, and it's I don't know that like. 
they, they're kind of saying that this is what's keeping him alive. So um, if he can make it to August, that'd be uh, really good. Um, horrible, horrible disease. We've also got the anniversary today of a very, very famous match, the Ricky Dozen and Kimura match against the Sharp Brothers, which was 70 years ago, 70th anniversary of yeah. that match. Yeah, that, that I mean, I was thinking when when, when I when I saw that that um, that um, if you try to think of like the most important pro wrestling match in history, um, it might be this one. Um, it's really hard to say the most important. Um, but it, 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 um, I mean, this one, there was no pro wrestling in Japan at this point, And then they just, uh, did that and the, they had that match and it was such a giant hit in Tokyo. And here we are 70 years later and pro wrestling still around and still, I mean, it's not that big right now, but I mean, historically it, it, it's, it's had many periods where it's, it's huge in Japan. And that match was the, the start of the Ricky Dozan, um, you know, glory period. You know, I mean, Ricky Dozan was, you know, not not just a famous athlete and not just a famous wrestler. I mean, he was a gigantic cultural figure in Japan in the 50s and early 60s until he was stabbed and, you know, kicked off. Um, you know, the, the, they started a promotion there and they were giant on television. I mean, basically, um, you know, one of the keys of, you know, television was in its infancy in Japan when this match took place most people did not even have televisions and there's photos that you could look up that shows like thousands and thousands and thousands of people gathering in different parks in tokyo to watch ricky dozan and masiko kimura against the sharp brothers on these screens that were put up in the parks it's, it's fascinating footage and you know it became you know uh you know immediately a, a booming industry and you know ricky dozan um i mean you know he's taught in the history books and in south korea or North Korea, actually. I mean, Ricky Dozan's like the cultural hero of North Korea, although their version of Ricky Dozan is very different um, from reality, um, completely different. It's 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 fueled by hatred and everything. In in North Korea, um, they tell the story that Ricky Dozan was this famous Korean athlete who beat all the Japanese, and because the Japanese could never beat him, they murdered him. You know, and it's it's a way that the government fuels hatred against Japanese is the fact that this legendary Ricky Dozan, you know, did that. And that's why Antonio Inoki was so famous and so popular in Korea, which remember the collision Korea shows um, was because he was introduced in Korea and introduced himself as the protege of Ricky Dozan, which which he was. I mean, um, you know, I mean, Ricky Dozan did go to Brazil and heard about this track star, you know, a uh, national champion, the shot and discus, and brought him back to Japan. Um, Inoki was living in, J in Brazil at the time, going to high school, and brought him back to be a pro wrestler. And today's also, by coincidence, would have been the 81st birthday of Antonio Inoki. So Antonio Inoki was born on this, um, it would have been Antonio Inoki's birthday. Um, he was born in 1943. So he would have been on, so the birth of Japanese pro wrestling was on Antonio Inoki's 11th birthday. And Antonio Inoki, you know, is probably the, today, the most famous Japanese wrestler of all time because Ricky Dozan, I mean, older, for older people, Ricky Dozan's far, far more famous. But, you know, I mean, he died in 1963. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's like the people who really know and understand the, the importance of Ricky Dozan. I mean, you know, now, I mean, those people would be 80, 80 years old and older, you know, so there's there's not a lot of them left. Whereas Anoki, a lot of people, you know, Anoki and Baba, there's still people alive that are not that old that, you know, remember their heyday. Well, it's funny that we should bring that up because we had a question from somebody on Twitter today. Shelton here said, Dave, out of all of the wrestling promoters you have studied, who would have been the best president Hypothetically, does he, mean, does he mean president of the United States or president of? President I think. Of the NWA? Well, yeah, because because he has a second part of the question asking about political office. So I think he's talking about the president. Many no. factors to consider: charisma, intelligence, ruthlessness. Most importantly, might be temperament, the ability to effectively delegate and judge talent. So I think that it, no, you but know, judge just, talent. Judge talent means to me. Judge talent means wrestling. 
I know, but his follow-up question here involves asking about wrestlers likely to run for political office now. So I think he's asking, who do you think would have been the best, we won't just say president, but like, you know, head of their country. And I bring it up because Inoki obviously ran for political office, yeah, and, uh, and others he, did as and, well. And Onita, Onita was in office, but they yes. were kind of joke candidates in a lot of ways. Um, and, you know, Inoki was always involved in one scandal after another, um, so... I can't think of any wrestling promoter that would make a good president of the United States. Um, none of them. None of them. They'd be, um, you know, um, I, you know, I mean, the most diplomatic was Sam Mushnick, for sure. But he wouldn't want to be president. You know, he didn't want to work that. Sam Mushnick, you know, I mean, he was a great promoter and everything like that. And, and um, you know, kept the NWA together um, many times when it was about to fall apart. And but the thing with Sam Mushnick was that, um, you know, he he wanted to live a normal life. He wasn't like crazy, like, you know, other promoters who just have nothing going on in their life but wrestling and work 18 hour days. And I mean, like I had told the story, I think, to Garrett recently was that, um, you know, they they didn't run for many, very many shows in the summer. In fact, they used to take the, at one point they like took the summer off or maybe they'd one run show in the summer. They did no TV in the summer. They would just bring in tapes from Georgia and Florida and, and other promotions um, because Sam just wanted to go to baseball games in the summer. You know, he wanted to go to the Cardinal games. He was friends with all the, you know, the, the owners of the Cardinals, and, and he was a celebrity in town, and he just wanted to go to his baseball games then. So it was very different, you know, from he would not have wanted to work the hours of being a, uh, um, you know, president of the United States. But I suppose from a diplomatic standpoint, he'd have been the best one. All right, WWE Fresno. Yeah, they ran last night in Fresno. I did not go. It's several hours away from here. But they did almost 10,000 people, and that was the biggest house show crowd that for any WWE show, aside from Madison Square Garden, um, which, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't count, but it's completely different. But it was the biggest house show crowd that they've done um, in the United States since August of 2001 which is right after the pandemic, and they did like 10,000 people for a show in Detroit. And it's like Fresno is not exactly Detroit, and it's certainly not Madison Square Garden. And, um, you know, it's a combination of... I mean, and, and Fresno is, is is always been a good wrestling city overall, but, but not like a great wrestling city, but always a good one per capita. You know, I mean, it usually does do better than most cities of its size. But, you know, 10,000 people for a house show, and it was just a normal house show. It was nothing... Um, you know, Cody Rhodes against Shinsuke Nakamura was the main event. Um, no, you know, nope. I'm, you know, Rollins isn't on the on tour anymore because of his knee. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Um, um, I think they had uh, L.A. Knight and uh, Solo Sokoa, and they had, um, oh God, I don't even remember what else. The um, Asuka and Michin. I know they had that one, and um, but yeah, just. A normal house show crowd. I mean, a normal house show show, and they did almost ten thousand people. So essentially, you know, yeah, it it. But they they did seventy five hundred in Oakland on uh, better than seventy five hundred in Oakland on on Saturday night as well, which I would have gone if it wasn't for the UFC. And um, you know, that's a great crowd for Oakland. And it's a great crowd for a house show. So WWE's on fire. You know, I mean, they're on fire. They are so popular. They uh they sold out tonight in Anaheim. Um, and you know for just a normal raw and um san jose i don't know it's going to sell out but it's it's not far from it so they may sell out next monday are you going no no nah, nah, i won't go to a raw because then i have to come back and watch it so no nah, no nah, i won't do that um it was a house show <laughs> they, they had a house show on a set i think i think everyone will give you permission to go to the show and not watch it again no, but the thing is, is that I won't know the news, so I'm gonna. I, I don't want to go to Raw. It's too difficult to do to do, go to Raw, come back, you know, then you know, get all the news together, then do the show. No, I'm not gonna go to Raw. I mean, I never do when they. I, I go. I've gone to SmackDown many times, but I haven't gone to. I don't go to Raw. I would go to a house show if it's the problem with the house show is they're usually Saturdays, and these days there's just so many things going on Saturdays. I mean, they're you know. There's almost always something going on, so it's it's hard. You know, I haven't been to a WWE house show in a, in a little while, um, but I went. To, I've been to SmackDown a couple times lately. I actually can't remember the last time that I went to a WWE house show. 
Yeah. And it was not for avoiding it either. It's like usually when they come here, it's for like a Raw or a SmackDown. I'm trying to remember yeah. the last time, because actually most of the house shows, I think it's, I think most of the house shows, for some reason, they run in like Eastern Washington or the, the Tri-Cities area. And I'm not going to the Tri-Cities to watch a house show. It's, it's easily two hours. And yeah, that's especially just... in the winter, you have to go over the pass. And I'm not going to do that. So, uh, yeah, they just, I mean, if they're going to run the greater Seattle area, it's always television. Yeah, we get we get a decent amount of shows actually because of um, you know the fact that it's San Fr- that, you know there's San Francisco, there's Oakland, there's San Jose. Stockton isn't that far. Sacramento is a little far for me, but I mean I could do it. You know I mean um, I mean Stockton's not a bad drive at all, and they you know they don't run Stockton all the time, but San Jose is a pretty regular stop, and um, San Francisco they they haven't had great success in San Francisco. Um, nor Oakland, but now, I mean, I think right now, I think they're in a situation where no matter where they go, they're going to have success. They don't even, they don't have many bad crowds these days. So, um, just, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's mania season. So that's picked up. I mean, they, they were, um, there was some period where they were starting to slide and then, um, you know, then they got rejuvenated and now it's funny. It's the, because these, these, these shows have had big, big walk-ups and it's not like Dwayne's on the show, but it, it feels like because Dwayne was on TV that all of a sudden WWE is even hotter than it's been. I mean, you know, with with or without him, I guess we'll, I guess maybe the rating this week will will indicate something. Although last week last week on Raw was really just the Cody and um, Seth Rollins segment that was really big, and this one like they, um, you know, when it comes to that stuff on tonight's show, they didn't. Um, they didn't really even go in that direction much. I mean, there's a little bit of a tease of Cody and Seth together, but they didn't, like, they weren't really overt. And obviously, they're setting up Jimmy and Jay, you know, for WrestleMania, which has been the plan for, like, six months. Um, so that plan hasn't changed at all. So they did that. And then, uh, you know, the other stuff on the show. Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But uh, today in the Daily Update, you said that you did not have the words for Michael Oku and Will Ospreay. Was, I think, just, but here uh, we are on the show, and it's all about words. You haven't seen the match, have you? I have not yet, no. Oh, my God. It, it's, like, seriously one, one of the best matches I've ever seen. I mean, storytelling-wise, like, there were aspects of their match two years ago that in some ways were more emotional than this one. But this one was, like, it, it, it combined um, the storytelling strength of the last one with a, a a series of emotion and crowd between Will Ospreay's last match in Rip Pro, which made him a big baby face, but he played the heel because the whole story is that Michael Oku has never beaten Will Ospreay. And everyone, you know, deep down was expecting it, but they gave you so many twists and turns that you weren't sure. And then Michael Oku, I mean, they went 47 minutes. And Michael, and and there was a period where Michael Oku had him beat i think he gave him um i forgot the move but it might have been it might have actually been the um stormbreaker or something but he he it might have been a pile driver but he had him beat and picked him up at two twice and that kind of was like one of those things where when oku picked him up the second time i think a lot of people started thinking like well wait a minute usually when you do that and you pick the guy up you know usually ends up losing the match which actually i thought was pretty brilliant but it also played off of the fact that osprey did that in their match two years ago they did a lot of stuff coming off of that match from two years ago and um it was it was just incredible michael oku beat him with a, a half crab in the middle um they um you know amira took like a couple of bumps she took a hidden blade when she protected um Michael Oku, when Will went for this flying hidden blade and she showed him out of the way and took it herself. So um, that was a pretty spectacular spot. And um, the crowd was just going insane. And so um, and the ring entrances were great. I mean, this was this was like an hour plus of of I don't even know what to say. Just just incredible, incredible show, I guess, is the best way to put it. And then Will did his interview at the end. And I mean, his, his go away interview, you know, and it was you know, when Will Ospreay, he, he's, he reminds me in some ways when it comes to, I mean, we'll see, we'll see an AEW. Um, but when Will Ospreay has something he believes in, he is really good. I just don't know how good he will be on promos. I just don't know. I've never seen him do promos if he's in like a really silly storyline. You know, it kind of reminds me of like, again, I was going to compare it to Brett, but it's, it's not a fair comparison. But when Bret Hart was really into his 
character and really into his story, Bret Hart was a great promo. But when Bret Hart thought that his character or his story was shit, you know, he couldn't bring himself to be, it, 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 you know, what Bret Hart was, was, was in his mind, real. And when it was something that he didn't buy himself, he couldn't do that promo um, for shit. Like if, if it's a shit storyline, he didn't, he never did great promos for shit storylines. Um, and other guys, you know, obviously can do that. So, um, will I, I, you know, hopefully he never has any shit storylines in AEW, but, um, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. And it was just something to see like Tony Khan's there and Will Ospreay's just going, thank you for changing my life, you know, and, and, and all that. Like after the match is over and he, Thanked, you know, everybody. He started there when he was 19. I saw a picture of him at 19, you know. Um, didn't look, he looked like, uh, Mike Von Erich or something. I don't know. He just didn't look like anything that where you would think that this was, um, you know, going to be anything. I, I don't think I saw him wrestle. I, I would say he was 22 when I first saw him, which I think would have been, um, I think 21, 22 when he had the, the first time I think I the first I, I I may have seen him before, but my first memory of him would have been the um, the Okada match in England. That was that was the match that set him up for New Japan. I saw that match because people were going like, oh, "You won't believe this guy who's wrestling Okada," you know, who's like twenty one, twenty two years old, and um, you know, and he was really good. And then I saw him in PWG very shortly after, I think. But um, I know when I know when I met him. I think he was 22, and he told me he'd only been wrestling for a couple of years. And um, I just saw him, and I go like, "You've been wrestling for like a couple of years, like like this was because he was great, and uh, obviously he's much better now." But um, but yeah, this match was um, um, just a great great story. I mean, and and I mean, I, honestly, I thought it was one of the best matches that I've ever seen. It was it was funny because. Um, this is this is it was it was as of late this afternoon it was listed as the eighth greatest match of all time on cage match ratings and then i put that on twitter and you can just imagine what happened then you know mm. people i don't know if they didn't watch the match and then maybe they did but boy did they flood twitter to get his numbers down to get this match number down it was hilarious how did this compare to the uh danielson match they're completely different matches. Um, I mean, I, th I think those are the two best matches of the year. That and uh, Will Ospreay and uh, Josh Alexander from from uh, TNA, which was an absolutely fantastic match, too. But, um, I mean, the Danielson match was a better technical wrestling match. I mean, the, with the actual moves that they did in the ins and outs, I mean, far superior. I mean, it's far superior to almost any match I've ever seen. It was just, you know, that was like uh, Volkan and Tamura level. Um you know, and, and, but, but with more professional wrestling elements in a Volcon Tamura match. But this match, I mean, as far as crowd heat, far above. As far as drama story, far above. Um, so it just depends on, like, if you like really cool wrestling, I mean, it's nothing's going to, nothing this year is going to, I shouldn't say that. I don't, because the fact is, is that Danielson and, and Sabre are probably doing a two out of three fall match and probably going to go really, really long knowing them in a two out of three fall match on a big stage somewhere. So I'm not, it, it'd be really ridiculous to say that nothing's going to top it. Plus, I've got to think that um, Brian Danielson and Will Ospreay are probably going to be doing a match between now and um, the end of the year. Uh, I think that's inevitable because this is Brian Danielson's farewell year with all of his dream matches. So, um, so there may be, you know, there may be something better. <laughs> I mean, this year there's, uh, you know, I mean, just, I mean, but, but, um, but as far as like drama story, um, if that's what you look for in wrestling, you know, um, he, um, you know, this was more of a fight in a lot of ways. And also the idea of a, of a, climactic you know like a i don't know how long the storyline was i mean they had been they've been wrestling for years and years and years they hadn't wrestled in two years but but um they've been wrestling for years and years and you know michael oku obviously had never beaten will and um you know um when they had the last one the idea it, it was very clear when the last when they had the last one that they could not do it again without michael oku winning he had to win the next one and so um they just didn't do the next one for two years, which to me, like, 
was way too long, but it worked out perfectly because it's, you know, Will Ospreay taps out for Michael Oku, um, which is like the greatest thing. Michael Oku is now the champion, and he was. He, he was the champion defending. Will was, you know, trying to win it in his last match. And then they, you know, they, you know, they had this horrible grudge and then they congratulate each other and it's over. And, um, they had a really cool scene when, um, Osprey does the big speech again. Then he leaves and, and, uh, right as he's leaving, Saber comes out and kisses him, you know, and it's just kind of like, uh, cause Saber, you know, it's like kind of like the two great stars and, and Saber was, was a top guy before Will was. So it's kind of like the, um, you know, the guy who preceded you as the top guy. And, you know, he's coming out to congratulate you at the very end of the show. And um, it was something. It was something. Um, I would, uh, like, everyone who I know who's seen it has just been, you know, just raving about it. It's 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 something special. I mean, whether it's, you know, one of the ten greatest matches of all time or whatever, you know, that's obviously everyone's interpretation. But it was... Um, one of the most memorable matches I've ever seen and um, and one of the best matches I've ever seen. I mean, when it was over, I was getting freaking tweets like crazy um, from people who were, you know, 6, 6.25, you know, 5.75 for people who were looking at star ratings. Nothing below 5.75 from people who, I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do, but, but from people who I got tweets from, nothing below that. So, and everyone was kind of like one of the greatest matches of all time. People who were there... For the most part, you know, saying it was the best match they'd ever seen live, or if not one of the best, um, you know, and, um, you know, in the commentary, I mean, when it was over, and granted, it's wrestling announcers, and it's Andy, you know, who's the promoter, but he's just going, this is the greatest wrestling match I've ever seen, and he did tell me, you know, goes like, you know, maybe it's live bias, you know what I mean, because he was in the building, but he thought it was the best match he's ever seen, so um, it's, it's, uh you know, and, and I know that the, the guys um, were very, very, very proud of the match, as they should be. Um, it's not, you know, again, it's not, from a technical wrestling standpoint, I, I would say I have seen, you know, better execution of moves type stuff. Um, but from a story standpoint, when you're talking about years and years and then the climax and the fact that it had to happen and they went 47 minutes and it was... Like it, here's, here's the other thing about the match. It went, I, I, you know, it was 47 minutes and 11 seconds. And then when I mentioned that, I had people contact me who were there, and they go, "No way, that was 47 minutes." And I go, "It was." They thought it was like 25 minutes because it was just, it, it, it's funny because it was like one of those Okada matches where, um, you know, it's like. I was looking at my watch and like we're 25 minutes in, and it's like we haven't even, st- it's, it's like we haven't even started. The, the, you know what I mean? You're just you're still building. You're not even close to the finish. Um, and the way it was going, when I saw that, I go like, I wonder if they're going to go sixty. And then I go like, I mean, it would work if they went sixty. It'd be a classic with this crowd. But it was, I just think you know, like, but Oku needs to win. And the fact that they gave you that finish, and all credit to Will. I mean, he you know he could have gone in there and go, I'm a big star and I'm going to AEW and you know. Let me win on a, you know, or lose. I'll lose on a gimmick. He didn't lose in a gimmick. You know, he lost with a half crab submission in the middle. So it was, uh, which was the the finish. It, should, it was the exact finish it should have been. All right. We got, uh, you didn't see any Fantastic Mania. No, but I heard that the last two match, the last two nights, the singles matches were great. I heard Rocky and Volador was like, and, and all different. You know, um, Ultimo Guerrero and Mystico was Ultimo Guerrero and Mystico. You know, just like exactly what you would expect those two. You know, they've been working together for 20 years anyway. And then, um, um, what was it, uh, um, Mosca Dorada, um, you know, and Stuka, I heard was spectacular. Um, I mean, I did see some, I, I have seen some of the matches, but they were like the tag matches and things like that. I didn't see anything from the um, from the last two nights. But the little bit that I had seen of Fantastic Mania, there were prelim matches that I saw that were nothing at all, you know, just like nothing. But, um, you know, very appreciative audience and, um, you know, like Mosca Dorada, you know, I mean, look, it's like his, his, this is like his trip. And, um, you know, he's, he was portrayed as this, the, the new young star, which he is in the company. And, you know, he delivered. He's, 
he's going to be like, I don't know if he'll be as big as Mystico. He'll be better than Mystico. But, um, yeah, he's, 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 I, you always love when you got like the guy in their early 20s who's right about at the top. And I think it's one of the things that's often been missing about American wrestling because they spend so much time, you know, in whether it's developmental or in the indies before you get spotted and you don't see that thing. But when you've got that, it really works bringing in, you know, for, for bringing in a younger audience when you've got that young star on the way up who's, who's portrayed as a main event or not just a guy on the card who happens to be 23. That's no big deal. But I mean, really like on top where you're, you've got that mentality of we're at, on the ground floor of seeing a new legend. And I think that's what, what the fans in Mexico see with Mascara Dorada. And I think that that is what the fans in Japan sort of saw as well in the sense of this is, you know, Mystico has been the guy, but they specifically put in uh, today's show, um, which was the final night of the tour, um, Mosca Dorada and Stuka was the main event, not Mystico and Ultimo Guerrero. So it's kind of like, okay, that's Mystico and Ultimo Guerrero were the guys, and they're still there in the semi main event, but Mosca Dorada and, you know, St Mosca Dorada is the, the guy now, the guy to watch out for. So, and I heard that they really, like I said, I heard they really delivered, and um, yeah, hopefully tomorrow I'll get to watch all that stuff. All right, we got uh, Rod to talk about, but first off, next couple of days we got shows, and the NXT show was taped last week, so if you want spoilers, that's on the Wednesday edition of the show. But the lineup, the non-spoiler lineup, is Lyra versus Shotzi for the women's title. We have got uh, Obafemi uh, versus Lexus King for the North American title, Josh Briggs and Brooks Jensen. Roxanne Perez and Ren Sinclair and Ilya Dragunov and Carmelo Hayes going face-to-face. -face. This is the show where uh, Shotzi gets injured, and right, they end up injured. having to uh, stop the match, and we get an impromptu title defense with Lyra versus Lash Legend, yeah. a six-minute match. So we'll see how she does. I was told that um, you may be impressed, so I guess we'll see. You know, it's so funny watching like Tiffany Stratton on the main roster because boy do you see the difference you know oh, yeah. I mean it's like it's like a lot more than than I even thought you know I mean it's like when she was in when she was in NXT I mean I thought she was great and on the main roster it's like she absolutely has potential but it's 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 just different which we'll talk about Well I think later. the big thing obviously is that if you're if you're going to bring in I don't know whoever uh, Okada and he Okada. does a few months or whatever in NXT, whatever. He can go up to the main roster. He's going to be great. But for the guys that have no experience whatsoever and the women that have no experience whatsoever, what they're missing is house show tours where they have to well, put together a match in well, the they afternoon. Are, they are doing house shows, but the thing with the house show... I know, but they're doing the same matches on these house shows. They're they're doing the same match with everybody. It's like they need experience with, well, they here's with your opponent, they work you've got two hours, put the match together. No, they work with different people. The problem with the house shows is because they have so many people, these matches are all short. So you, you kind of like, you know, you, you rely on your pattern stuff. So, you know, you're right in the sense that they're not growing, but because when you're trying to get 10 matches in a show and keep the show at two hours or two and a half hours, you know, you're going to have short matches and um, and you're also, for the most part, because they don't do the thing that they used to do when JR was in, with developmental, where you would um, send, you know, like the guys on the roster that were really good, but just, you know, like a Jerry Lynn, he's really good, but he's not going to, they didn't, they're not going to do nothing with him. So we'll send him to OVW and we'll have him work with like different guys at house shows every night and they actually, and doing, you know, house shows four nights a week. You know, here we've got the two house shows every other week. And they're working with each other. I mean, which is better than nothing. It's better than not working. But it's it's and they're working short matches also. So that's you know, I mean, by having so many people like with OVW, one of the things with um, where you know, when you look back on that OVW class when they had Cena and Orton and all these guys, Brock Lesnar, Dave Batista, all came out, Shelton Benjamin, all at the same time. One of the things was is that um, they only had a certain number of people in that camp it's and, it, and the number was far less than 75 or whatever the number is or 100 that they got now you know it was like you know maybe 10 so those guys were working 
every night and they were hands-on the coaches that were there were hands-on with lots of time with them when there's this many people i think that i don't even think the progress is much slower even though they're recruiting some pretty badass athletes you know for this thing but they're not you know they're not progressing at the level that the guys progressed 20 years ago for you know a variety of reasons yeah now we got the uh, Dynamite show, which has four announced segments. There was no collision this week, and so they didn't announce anything on Saturday. Well, we got Moxley and Claudio versus Dax and Cash. We have got Swerve and Brian Cage and Samoa Joe versus Hangman Hook and Rob Van Dam. And then we just know Deanna's going to be in action and Tony Storm's going to be in action. And we know nothing else for the show as of uh, Tuesday morning. Yeah, well... You know, they do have, you know, they, they, they appear to have some momentum. You know, I mean, the um, last week, the uh, Rampage did their best number of the year, best number in a long, long time. Collision did their best number of the year. Um, you know, um, uh, Dynamite did not do their best number of the year, but considering the night, they did freaking great. I mean, they beat everything on television except for CBS and NBC head-to-head. Or CBS and um, and uh, ABC. They beat NBC. Um so I mean, they had a they had a great number on Wednesday. Um, so we'll see if the momentum continues. I mean, we're still. I mean, to me, the real sign is when we start seeing uh, ticket sales go up, and um, you know, well, we, we monitor that stuff close. It's not there yet. It has not happened. Um, ratings wise, yes, there's something that's there. There appears to be some momentum there, but uh, you know, the key still to me is is. Uh, getting people to uh, come out for these shows and um you know the the show this this week um tulsa first time ever in tulsa and they're under three thousand i mean they may they may top three thousand by wednesday but like to me like first time in tulsa it should be 4500 people um and and obviously it's it'll be more than half of that but you know it may not even be two-thirds all right, the uh, Raw show had a lot of noteworthy things on it, including the opener, which was Drew McIntyre and Cody Rhodes. And they had a very, very good, probably pay-per-view caliber match. Went through two commercial breaks, three segments. And they're doing this match, great heat, crowd hates Drew, they love Cody. And finally there at the end, Jimmy Uso hits the ring to distract Cody. Drew goes after him, but Cody avoids it, goes for the crossroads. Ref is distracted, and Solo comes out of nowhere. He spikes Cody in the neck. Drew hits the Claymore and pins him. This is the first time that Cody has been pinned since he lost to Roman Reigns. And only the second time since he's been back. Yep, the second time since he's returned that he's been pinned. And when this match was over... I had three takeaways, okay? Yes. You only hold do you hold up three fingers or two? I have three takeaways. Okay, that you, you can. Takeaway number one is Drew almost certainly has to be re signed. Um I think he's agreed. I I'll find out. I'll find out. I mean he wasn't he wasn't as of um Thursday. But, um, he, but he's either got to be resigned or I mean, they have he, a strong verbal commitment for him to oh, beat Cody in this match. Well, he's not going anywhere. I mean, I think that that's pretty clear. Because here's the thing: number one, like one of the things that I think was up in the air was the idea of he wanted to be used well, and obviously he's being used really well, and he's having a lot of fun with this portrayal. So. Um, you know, it, it would be, it would not be smart because you never know, like when you leave, if you come back, you know, if, if they'll forget, not forget about you, but you'll have the momentum. So the thing is, is like, if Cody wins the title, which he should, Drew is now, in theory, the top contender. The thing is, is that that was we, number two. Drew is, is almost certainly his first major challenger after he wins the title. But then what do you do with Drew? Do you just beat him in the chamber and not put him with uh, Seth Rollins? Or do you put him in with Seth Rollins? But then if they're both, if you put him with Seth and he loses, that's kind of stupid if he's going to then feud with Cody. if And plus, he's been beaten by Seth so many times. So it's almost like, you know, maybe he gets screwed in the chamber by, some, by something. I don't know. The booking this weekend of the, of the men's chamber is going to be very interesting. 
But I do think when this match was over, my first thought was, is like, yeah, Drew McIntyre's going to be the first challenger for Cody. Makes all the sense in the world. Yeah. And then my other takeaway is that they're going to do a spot at WrestleMania where Solo shows up and he thumbs Cody and they have an incredible near fall, which he is going to kick out of. Yeah, I think so. I think so. They sh- that, that, that makes all the sense in the world, too. So, yeah, this was a great match and a uh, an excellent finish, I thought, in terms of setting up a lot of different things for down the road. Mm-hmm. I thought it was a, I thought it was a smart finish. And the deal was as they try to make Drew to be a hypocrite because, um, you know, Drew knew he saw that Cody was screwed and he still took advantage of it. And then Drew goes, you know, like and it was, and it was brought up. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I really liked about the show. You know, another thing I like is um, the the new production is really grown on me. We know when they're doing the stuff with just a lot of the new different things that they never did under Kevin Dunn. Um, that they that they're doing with the show new, um, you know, like the guys coming to the building and the time, you know, just give it that sports feel. And they they did a lot of they did even more of this on this show than they've done so far. And I think that that just it gives it a better, more professional, more big league feel. I think the TV comes across way more big league um, the way it's being produced now. So another good thing. Then we had an Andrade promo, and he said he was a third-generation luchador, and he had no choice. His family, even his wife, were wrestlers. They, 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 said many... his wife, they said his wife, but they didn't tell you who his wife was. No, they did not. So they all had many expectations, and he didn't let that stop him. He said, my destiny is here. The era of Andrade El Idolo has yeah. begun. So he is using his AEW nickname and not his former WWE name as part of this new character. But he was he he was um, he used El Idolo in um, WWE before, before he was you know, um, like they called him like it wasn't it wasn't his ring name, but he was Andrade El Idolo in WWE before, so that's not like they taking the taking everything from the thing, and they may still just introduce him as an Andrade, but you know he will call himself El Idolo. Pierce is backstage. He asks Cody how he's doing, and Cody says, I'm fine, I'm fine. And so Pierce walks out, and then in walks Seth, and he looks at Cody, a knowing look. He pats him on the leg, and he walks off. And when this was over, I thought, man, this tag team seems like a lock. Well, I mean, that's the plan. You know, I mean, um, unless something changes, that's the plan. And obviously we saw something change in the women's match, the women's battle royal. Um and, and it probably did since Friday because remember, if you saw the scene on Friday where they had everyone there that was for the um, the women's chamber, they had Cargill in the room, you know, basically foreshadowing. And the plan was Cargill, and then they took her out for probably all the reasons that I said that they should, you know. I mean, because it, it 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 actually, if you really looked at it, it made no sense to put her in that chamber match, none at all. And so they didn't. They put uh, Raquel Rodriguez in instead. We had the last chance battle royal for the shot of the Elimination Chamber, which, as you just noted, Raquel returned and won. And, uh, you know, they had every every woman of any renown in WWE that's not in a big match was there. You had Maxine, and there was a redhead that took me forever to identify. It was B-Fab. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Like, you wouldn't have known who she was until they called her name. No. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a couple of storylines. Natty got revenge on Tegan for throwing her out of the Rumble, and she tossed her out. And then the, the, you know, Electra was, tossed what, Alina, and they brawled to the back. Okay, and, the, and the, the one thing that was funny was when Natalia threw, like, this this match, for the most part, didn't have any heat. I mean, at, at the end, there was, there, there was, but it was one of those matches where you could see the people were not interested. But when Natalia threw Tegan out, there was like a pop. You know, it's kind of like they knew that spot from, you know, the Rumble, and... They got it, but, um, you know, they did the same, uh, you know, Final Four, and then all of a sudden Chelsea Green shows up because she was actually never eliminated, and they teased that she was going to win, but, of course, she did not. Yeah, when it got down to the Final Four, I mean, it started to get a lot of heat. I mean, they they built up that Raquel, Zoe, and Shayna were – Zoe and Shayna together as a team, and then Raquel individually. Yeah, they were the ones who threw I mean, almost everyone They out. were the ones tossing everybody out, so it came down to the two of them – and uh, Raquel ended up, yeah, well, Meechan was there as well. She got tossed. But Raquel tossed out Zoe and Shayna. And then, uh, yeah, they, they 
And they did the deal where the announcers thought she won, but they didn't ring the bell. And then Chelsea slides in and tries to eliminate Raquel, but then she gets tossed out. And, I mean, the place went crazy when she tossed out Chelsea and won the match. So, I mean, as far as battle royals go, the last few minutes, it was pretty good. Yeah, it was a battle royal. Um, Yeah, the finish was fine, but it was, you know, it was just a battle royal that whatever, nothing, you know, it wasn't, and you know, I mean, there, you know, a lot of the women there in the, in that battle royal were not that good, and the ones who were good were trying to lead the other ones through, and it was just kind of, just kind of there, especially at the early part, you know, when you had a lot of people in there, mm, didn't do much till, you know, till the end. Now we had a Jey Uso promo about the main event with Gunther, and then a sit down with Nia and Rhea, yeah, and so with, Nia with, with, with Jay. So with Jay, the thing was is that. Um, they kept pushing this was the biggest match of Jay's life. And I kept thinking... That's this, ridiculous. He was in the main event of SummerSlam for the world title. Fighting the, Roman Reigns for the title. For the for the universal title, right? For the big title, yeah. for both belts. So how could this be the biggest match of his career? Well, it was not. It was a yeah. false statement by whoever had the temerity to say that. Well, they, they, they said it multiple times, so it was part of the, it was part of the scripted storyline. Is to mm, tell people that. terrible. It wasn't terrible. like Michael Cole just came. Michael Cole doesn't come up with stuff like that out of the blue. It's it's like this is how we're going to build it. This is the biggest match of his career. So, you know, it was it it's that was the tagline. So Rhea said this was the first time she's going to be able to headline a show in Australia. It's champion. She'd earned this, and she said that for a while I was having a rough time. Almost almost thought about quitting. But then I sat down, I reminded myself of who the hell I was, the most dominant woman in WWE. And Nia says, you know what? I'm twice your size and triple your talent. I'm going to squash you and you're going to run home and cry to your own mommy. Well, one, then, one, of those thing, one of those things is true. The other one wasn't. I don't, I don't think that uh, she has triple the talent of... No, Maria she does not me. have triple the talent. I don't have an exact measurement, but uh, uh, I think that might size, be up there with... She's, the she's, biggest she's, match of Jey Uso's career. Triple the talent would be, yeah. Yeah. Maybe so then we about to maybe, crumble maybe, her and... Maybe maybe she like got her percentages mixed up and it was she meant a third of the talent. Mm. So Rhea's going to crush her and uh, destroy all of her momentum in Australia, which I, I believe is very likely to happen. She better she better win. That, but, you know, she will, because we already know it's... it's um, Rhea Ripley and I mean they've been building Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch up for for forever already so to do anything else would just be you know trying to fool people at this point it'd just be silly so they do a lot of stuff with the truth and it's kind of hit or miss and on this show we had he was so over tonight though yeah this video this this truth line thing with Jackie Redmond this was this was like a cornball you know, interviews straight out of some 1990s true crime TV show. They had the goofy music playing and, you know, I'm never, I mean, I'm never, I'm never a fan of the music and promos. That's for sure. Mm. Well, it wasn't even like it wasn't a movie. It wasn't music in a promo. It was supposed to be like you were watching a television show and they had the music in the background as this person is being interviewed about this horrible crime that was committed against them. And uh, eh, this was not my thing here. And I, I, I uh, like there, 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 I like couple, truth, but there were a couple. There were a couple of side gags in the promo, but he was really over in the building, like really. Yeah, he's over. over as a performer, but I mean, I didn't like this segment. Then I go to Michael Cole and he goes, "That was something," and yeah. I thought, "God damn, you're right. That was something." Hmm. So then we had something. Here was another something. Michael Chandler is introduced, and he grabs the mic and he cuts this wild promo. And he says, I am the most entertaining UFC fighter on the planet. There's a man from Ireland who has been making me wait for way too long, and I still have one dude on my mind. So, Conor McGregor, get your candy ass back in the octagon. We've got some unfinished business. And the place goes nuts, and he starts taking off his shirt, and he's going crazy. They cut away from him, and they go back to the announcers, and Pat McAfee's trying to get the camera back on this crazy guy with his shirt off, and they were not going to film him again. And then they cut backstage to Chad gable and the fans all booed that was that was something when i mean that, that you know because, because pat mcafee was basically you know get that camera back on him while he's running around with the shirt off now you know michael chandler is a 
Ah, what a surprise, right? Big pro wrestling fan. Um, just like uh, loves Rick. Hey, Blair. cut a hell of a promo. Yeah, yeah, he's a good talker. He's he's you know, but he's a big time pro wrestling fan, and um, you know, obviously loved it there. But I mean, we're you know, I mean, we had Punk at uh, the UFC, and um, we're gonna have you know, and it makes all the sense in the world to do it. You know, have more cross promotion guys go in there and plug you know. Plug the shows. I had thought that, like, on Raw, we'd be seeing a lot more plugging of the, the pay-per-views from the UFC pay-per-views. And, and maybe in time we will. And vice versa, like before WrestleMania, have guys show up on the UFC pay-per-views. We should. It makes all the sense in the world. Um, and they must have some deal with Jelly Roll, too, because they were plugging his, con- his concert tour. So, he yep. must, they, yep. so you know, and I mean, it's like it's not like it's Bad Bunny who's wrestled there. I mean, he's he's done a couple of gigs for them. But I mean, there's there's obviously a deal there, and then they um, was it Calum Walsh? Was that the name of the guy, the the boxer? Yeah. yeah so yeah. Calum Cal Walsh, who evidently must be a boxer, and you know the Dana has because they were pointing out he's endorsed by Dana White, and he's training, but he's trained by Freddie Roach, and I mean he's just a boxer who's going to be on a a, a pay per view show, I think, or, or some show. Um, I think at the theater in the in MSG that they were plugging. So they're doing a lot of, um, you know, like they're plugging a lot of outside stuff on their show now. You know, not just the wrestling. I mean, bo- boxing, music, and UFC. Well, then we had Truth and Miz and DIY versus Judgment Day at Man Tag. And yes, we want Truth Chance. They went crazy for his hot tag, his John Cena hot tag. And then Priest got the blind tag, and they cut him off for a little while. So that led to Ciampa getting the big hot tag there at the end. We had the eight-way, everyone hitting their big moves. And it ends up with Truth and Priest in the ring together. Truth hit a scissors kick. Fans went nuts thinking he was going to pin Priest. But, of course, Priest kicked out. Finally, Box of Ears hit South of Heaven, pinned Truth. And uh, good match and great heat for this match. Yeah, it was a good match, but the, the wrong finish. I mean, they had three other guys that weren't nearly as over as our truth. Um, I know that, like, in their slotting, you know, our truth is this comedy guy who you don't take seriously. But at some point, you know, when when someone gets hot, you know, you don't have to beat him. You know what I mean? Just because you know you you slot him at a certain level when he when someone breaks past that level, you know, you should book based on that and you know they did not adapt you know i mean i'm not saying that they you know you 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 how do you know ahead of time but in this case i think that it's been that way i mean he he was he's been at shows he's been house shows he's getting a big pop you know you could beat gargano you could beat champa it doesn't matter you know what i mean i wonder if the idea is they've got their wrestlemania plans and their post mania plans and Damian Priest as champion is not fitting into those plans. And so Priest is just going to screw Truth and pin Truth and beat Truth. And then ultimately he tries to catch in and Truth screws him. You can do that. You can do that. Yeah. Yeah. But he doesn't need to beat, but he still doesn't need to beat him here. And well, that's part of the deal is he has to humiliate him, humiliate him, humiliate him. Well, and we'll so when the, Truth finally costs him the deal, Truth is over as a massive baby face for doing it. Yeah. Or it may just be that they never bring up this finish ever again. Could be. Hmm. But we've we've uh, we've seen a lot of follow up to everything they've done with Truth and Damian Priest. So obviously there's something going on with these two guys, I would think. But we shall see. Yeah. We had a Sam interview and speaking of things going on. Sammy once again talked about how he knows there is a road to WrestleMania. He knows there is a path. He doesn't know what it is, but it will prevent him. It will present itself to him if he does not get into his own way. He's got to let Drew McIntyre go for now, and he's got to trust his gut. Well, and when he was I, done, I thought, my God, is it going to be Sammy Zayn beating Gunther for the title at Mania? Well, that that's the one that that it could be, you know, because Gunther does need an opponent with no Lesnar. He sure does, and it doesn't look like it's going to be Braun Breaker at this point. No, because they put Braun Breaker on the other brand. I mean, they could st- yeah. it's not like they can't do it, but but generally speaking, and I mean, they just put him on the new brand. You know, it's not like, you know, he's been on the brand for like nine months when you can do a switch. It's like, if you're going to do it, you know, he should be on Raw. 
We had Becky coming out for a promo, and this ended up being the exact promo you would expect, which is she cut a promo about how she's going to be facing Rhea for the title at Mania, and Pat McAfee immediately jumps in and says, or Nia. But Becky keeps on going about uh, Rhea Ripley and how they're going to have this match one of these days. It's going to happen one way or the other. And she gets interrupted by Liv Morgan. And Liv cuts a promo about how she used to be a tag team partner with Rhea and a friend. But then Rhea turned on her and she teamed with Raquel. And then Rhea cost them the tag team title. So she is out for revenge. And then Raquel interrupts, and then Naomi interrupts, and then Tiffany finally interrupts, and then actually Bianca finally interrupted. And so all of the women are out there. They all cut their promos. A huge brawl breaks up, or breaks out. And somehow, out of nowhere, Nia Jax appears, and she destroys all six women. She leg drops everybody. She just crushes them all single-handedly. She got a ton of heat, so they really want you to believe that there's a possibility that she is going to win the title and go on to WrestleMania. I don't know. I didn't think the Nia Jax thing was... I mean, it just basically made everybody look like jobbers, especially like the the, the interaction with Bianca Belair because Bianca Belair is kind of a superstar. I mean, it's it's one thing of like Bianca... Bianca Belair. You have Becky Lynch in there for crying out loud. But I know who's going to be who's going to be going for the championship at WrestleMania. Yeah. And, and Tiffany Stratton, who is just debuting, so the last thing she needs is to look like just freaking you know, lunch meat, which she did. You know what I mean? It's like, I wouldn't have done... I, I just thought that that thing, it, it like kind of buried the chamber match. It's like it's a bunch of women that are not at the level of Rhea Ripley and Nia Jax when, when it should be... You know, it, it, was, it, was, it was unnecessary. Like, if she went in there and she squashed one person, you know what I mean? That'd be one thing. But for, to have her squash six people... Especially Raquel in her first match back after winning the Battle Royal, and then she just squashes her. So yeah, I um, I don't know. I thought that they hurt people. That that it was not the week to hurt. We had a Nakamura promo on Sammy. They're going to be wrestling next week on the show, and then we had Ivar and Chad Gable, which, as you would expect, was a very good match because Ivar is. Very underrated, very agile. Chad Gable's awesome. They just had a great match. And uh, Ivar tried the doom salt at the end. Gable moved. He'd been trying to delay German the entire match. He finally hit it. Hit a moon salt for two. And then Ivar kicked out. Chad went for the ankle lock. Ivar cra- crawled for the ropes. Gable pulls him back to the middle, and he gets the submission. So they played it up as this being the end of the feud, as Ivar had run through everybody else in the... Uh, Academy, including Otis. Uh, but here at the end, Chad Gable beat him. Yeah. Good match. You know, yeah. yeah. They're, both, they're both very talented. Yeah. I. It's interesting to see what they do. Maybe they're, you know, they could always go with Gunther and Chad Gable. That's an unfinished story. They could because they were building that up for a long time and then they dropped it. Yeah. But yeah. they had they'd played it up big like he wanted another shot. So. Yeah. Yeah. Drew did a promo. And, they, and he, they, they've, been, and they've been wrestling at the house shows, too. Drew said he always told the truth. Cody had been on a run of a lifetime. One person had pinned him until tonight, and he was the second, the savior of WrestleMania. And he said that his win was not tainted by the bloodline's interference. He wanted to attack them on site, but he thought big picture. He was doing a favor for the world title, for Raw, for the fans, and he's going to smack down to face L.A. Knight. And then he's going to go to Australia to win the Elimination Chamber. It's The Chamber's interesting because, you know, at first, before Drew McIntyre beat Cody Rhodes, I thought he would probably win the Chamber and maybe win the world title if, if Seth needs time off. Um, but now I think that if, if um, you know, he's going to be facing Cody for the championship, if that's the direction, then he probably shouldn't be in the Chamber and then losing at WrestleMania. So um, maybe that puts Randy Orton in the spot. You know, I mean, they've been pushing Randy Orton very, very, very hard. I mean, they could they could go with L.A. Knight or somebody else too. But um, yeah, it, it's that that men's chamber match actually should be really freaking good if you really look at like um, there's enough good talent in there. It should be really good. New Day did a promo. They'll be facing Imperium in a street fight next week. And then the main event was Gunther, Jey Uso for the Intercontinental title, and it was a good match. 
but match, nobody think. believed that Jey Uso was going to beat Gunther for the title, and they tried to they get the fans spear to after it. spear. You know, he hit five spears during this match, yeah. including one on the apron, one outside, and he throws the guy in the ring. He hits the big splash. The ref starts counting, and suddenly the bell rings, and this idiot ref stops counting to that look over stupid. to see what's going on. That was that's like, I mean. I, I I mean I know that 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 gimmick finish was there for a reason and obviously to set up Jimmy and Jay and all but there was just the way it was done it just made the ref look so stupid. Well, he uh, stops counting and then Gunther tries to choke, but Jimmy slips out. Turns out it was Jimmy who was ringing the bell, and then uh, Jimmy hits a or Jay hits a dive onto the entire bloodline outside. Tries another splash, but Gunther gets the knees up, cradles him, and pins him. So Jay does not win the title in the biggest match of his career. And then Jimmy attacks Jay afterwards, gives him two big splashes off the top. And uh, Jimmy versus Jay added to WrestleMania. Not officially, but it's going to be on the show. But, but uh, obviously strong angle, and that's, that was, that's probably the direction, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, overall, I thought there was a lot of good stuff they did for Elimination Chamber and a lot of good stuff they did for Mania. And we still have... Uh, a lot of time between now and WrestleMania to follow up on Elimination Chamber, which is Saturday, everybody. Yeah. And I would at, say uh, when... five AM Eastern, two Pacific. Yeah. Um I think that um as far as we should have a pretty good idea of about three more matches or four more matches, I would think, coming out of the chamber. Or coming out of the show. All right, before we go, there's another question you had on the uh mailbag. Which was, Dave, can you tell us what you remember from being at the Terry Funk and Dory Funk Jr. versus Prada Morgan and uh, L... L... L yes. L... L... Hippicio. Um, yes, who, in who, all Japan. Yeah, this is 1984 match, so it's like 40 freaking years ago. But I do remember, I think it was in uh, maybe Chiba. I mean, the city I could be wrong about. But um, I do remember the match, and... Um, I remember that um, Terry Funk was flying for Parada Morgan in those ma- in that match, which afterwards, because I was out with Terry Funk afterwards, and he had mentioned to me that like a lot of the um, American guys, you know, which probably means Stan Hansen and Bruiser Brody, um, were not selling for them because they thought that they were too small. But he thought that Parada Morgan was super talented. So he freaking sold like crazy for Parada Morgan. And, um, you know, very, you know, it was, it was really good. Parada Morgan at that point in time, you know, before he got older, I mean, he was, he was excellent. And AEPCO was fine. But, but Parada Morgan was a, uh, you know, I mean, you know, he was like a junior heavyweight there, but, but really good. I mean, he was one of those, those guys who could, from Mexico, who could go to Japan. And, you know, a lot of the guys from Mexico because of the style. You know that, that Mexico had, and 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 in some cases still has. You know, you go to Japan and you kind of get, you know, I, I don't want to say exposed because it's not a fair term. You know your style, and in Japan it doesn't translate. It, it doesn't mean that you're weak. It just means that you know your style. But Morgan was talented enough to where he, um, and he had worked with Misawa in in Mexico, so um, he was talented enough to where he could go there and have really good matches anyway. So um, yeah, I guess that's the thing that I remember is that Terry. Really wanted to sell for him because he thought that he was um, very, very talented and and deserved it. And so Terry was really like just taking big bumps for the guy, and and it was a very entertaining match, you know, when when Morgan was in, and it was fine when when Ehi PCO was in as well. All right, everybody. On that note, we're going to wrap it up for today. The new observers up on the front page, back issue as well. And Dave and Garrett did two shows this past weekend that you can head up there and check out. The Friday and show. And we're going to be back. Uh, the Friday show was really something that you probably should listen to. I mean, I was so happy with that Friday show. Like probably the happiest I've been with the show in a long time. Just um, Tim Marchman did a great job. You know, as far as being a guest, and we really went in deep in into all the Vince stuff, and it really made me think a lot about all of this stuff and all the, you know, I mean, the one thing, the one thing, and it even comes out, there was a, there was a thing today, you know, where um, Lee Cole brought out a ring boy and, um, you know, told stories from, you know, and now we're talking, um, you know, 30, 30 plus years ago, you know, this is like the Terry Garvin, Mel Phillips stuff. 
Um, and the thing is, is like, you know, there's WWE was always to, you know, you know, whatever, like they always had their, their story and everything like this. But I think that the thing that really, and it's, it's, it's sad for them, but I mean, they, they, you know, it's, it's what corporations have to do. But I will say that when it comes to the credibility of WWE's denials, the Ashley Massaro thing pretty much, um, made that era WWE, that McMahon, uh, WWE, um, it really kills their credibility for any kind of a defense because you just can't believe them because I mean, they just, when you lie at that level, um, you know, you, you, ba you basically, to me, you lose your credibility for any defense and that's what happened. And, um, you know, just looking back at that whole thing and, 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 and it lies in a horrible, horrible, horrible story. That's the thing. If it's just a, like a, a story that's not that important, it's one thing. This was, you know, I mean, it's all there, but it's, it's the, the, that, that, the lies about the Ashley Massaro rape and her reporting it and not reporting it and this and that. Um, when I look back now at what they said, what all those people said, it wasn't just like one person in the company. It was one person after another, after another. And it's just like, you know, it's, um, I know I get it, but, uh, man, chickens came home to roost on that one, man, there. There, you know, it was a it's it was a um, concerted effort by multiple people to portray this woman who had been raped on their watch as a fan, you know, a fantasy nut, you know, someone who makes something up. And, you know, I mean, I think everything that's come out has shown that that's not what happened. And um you know, her her friend has talked about everything, and I know I I mentioned this with with Garrett and everything. One of the things that I've gotten from from several people there is this one, and and there's a Daily Mail article as well. This one points right at Stephanie, and you know a lot of people want to go. You know, Vince is the monster, and Vince is gone, and and John Laurinaitis, um, but it is an institutional thing that everyone there always. It's just how it is. They always protect the company no matter what no matter how heinous it's always protect the company and and of course stephanie is like that but i do know people in the company that are there now that were very um heartbroken um disappointed uh, whatever term you want to use it varies just because of their you know the people who like stephanie that's what it was and you have to confront they confronted the idea of Wow, this is like the Stephanie that we liked, and she, she, she really did. The credibility was such that you believe that what that story was, she really did, especially when Ashley's best friend said it. So, um, you know, basically, it's that it, for those who who didn't read the Daily Mail article or watch News Nation or read any of the other stuff, the basic just is is that um, Vince, you know, even though they pretend they knew nothing, Vince had Stephanie talk to her before the the meeting that she had where they told her not to report it but stephanie was involved in the cover-up too and i think that that's where or allegedly um but there's the the belief is from a lot of people there um who didn't want to believe that um they're confronted with something where you know because of the company's lack of credibility on everything um they're believing that and it's uh it is what it is well, that is the Friday edition of the show. If you want to head up there and check that out. And uh, back to show us up now as well. Dave and I are going to be back on Wednesday, AW and NXT, as well as all of the rest of the news. So you can check that out. And that's it, everybody. We'll